Today, we are talking about how to crush it with your challenge style launch. Here today, we have the master of challenge launch launches, Zach Buckler. He's the founder of Heart, Soul & Hustle and the host of the podcast by the same name, where he teaches business owners how to leverage Facebook ads and launches to strategically maximize leads, conversions and sales and ultimately profit. And like, we're like, we're like the younger tier. I'm like, I'm, I'm not 30 yet. So I'm like, I'm still with you. So at, at 25, Zach has helped students execute six figure launches and create sustainable sales funnels that leverage Facebook ads and allow them to work less and get more profit. So good. Like literally, if you guys don't know Zach, I'm so excited for you to get to meet him today, get to know him, get to learn from him. Cause like you are just like one of my fave people in the online space to learn from. Like you, like we're in the same mastermind and just like this last year, I've just loved being in the room with you because you always add so much freaking insight to like any questions that people have. I'm just like, what? Like, how does his brain work? So thanks for being here. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. So for those people who don't know you and haven't been stalking you for as long as I have, how did you get started in the online world and and what brought you to where you are today? Totally. So I really started in the online space like 12 years ago uh, when I was fascinated by the idea of- When you were how old? I would have been 13 at the time. <laughs> and I, I know this like, because- what? <laughs> yeah, I know this because uh, actually I started when I was like 12 and a half because I had to be 13 for like my first online money making scheme and I pretended to be my dad and I used his social security number to get paid um, with his permission, of course. Um, but I like started way, way back in the day. I was just fascinated by the idea of you could make money online. And so one of the first things I ever did was what was called pay-to-click advertising, which you guys are familiar with PPC, but this is PTC, where you get paid to click on advertisements. And I started back when I was like 13, and I used to get paid to click on these ads, and then you could hire people to be your referrals and click on ads under you. And I basically built up this like small empire where I was making like 20, 30 bucks a day when I was like 14, 15 years old. And I ended up making um, $13,000 doing that. Now granted, like 50 or 60% of that went back into the business. But when I was like 14, 15 years old, that was pretty stinking cool. So and that's how I started. And I was just wow. fascinated by this idea. And it evolved into everything you can imagine. So I've done paid surveys. I've done affiliate marketing. I've done niche blogs. I've done direct sales. I've done services. Um, when I started this business, I started by doing Facebook ads for people. And then um, I started talking on Periscope, which is like old school, if you guys remember Periscope. Throwback. <laughs> old school now, like yeah. two and a half years is old school. Um, <laughs> but I started on Periscope talking about how I was leveraging Facebook ads. And what ended up happening was our email list started growing. People started asking me how we were getting clients with live streaming. And so I created a live streaming course, which ended up being our first six figure course. And then I pivoted to start talking about Facebook ads because that's really where my passion was, was Facebook ads. And after doing that for a couple of years, we started really questioning, how do we make a launch that's more effective? So after like 10 years of this dabbling online, we really started to be successful with online courses. And what was happening was our online courses were working, but we were like killing ourselves to launch them. Mm. And so I remember back in 2015, we launched my Facebook ads course and it took us about three months to actually launch the dang thing, um, which was so much time. And I remember being like, this is not sustainable. I cannot spend three months launching my content. It was just, it was wow. so much work. I was exhausted. I was staying up all night. And I remember finishing that launch and being like, oh my gosh, I should be so happy. It was like a $20,000 launch and I was just exhausted. Yeah, just totally burnt out. Wait, so what did you guys do for that launch that it took three months? 
we were just planning and outlining and prepping and doing webinars and like it just took months to just plan and execute yeah. and creating content and trying to build the email list and like doing all the stuff um and then what ended up happening was a few months later i met up with a friend in new york city and she was like you should try a challenge and I met with her for like five minutes and I just ended up doodling this little piece of paper. I call it the, the six figure doodle um, <laughs> generating so much revenue for us. Um, we doodled this thing out and we ended up running a challenge. And in two weeks we matched the profits that we had done in our three month launch. And we were like, okay, there is something here. So we sat down and we reverse engineered it and we did another challenge and we did another challenge and we really refined it into this unique system that leverages um, email marketing, Facebook advertising, Facebook groups, and Facebook live streams to actually create a cohesive system where we can actually track what's happening. And we've, we've now coined that into the five figure challenge system, which is our signature course. And we've helped people in every space you can imagine from finance to dog training, to manifestation, to Instagram, to green smoothies, um, and everything in between. And it's been so stinking cool to watch our students uh, run successful challenges and thrive. And now we teach that as our signature offer. And that brings us to where we are today. I love it. So have you seen the same type of results with a lot of your students where they had tried other launches in the past, but once they kind of lock into this specific system that things just kind of shift? Totally. So we have a student who just went through, um, who had actually run a challenge with our, without our system, and she essentially doubled her sales. And wow. what we find out is that it's not like, okay, so I'm just going to be really candid. Like it's yeah. not challenges that are the secret, right? So the reality is webinars work, challenges work, everything works. I'm partial to be like, run a challenge, right? <laughs> but I have a little bit of bias. Yeah. The, the thing that we find works for most people is that they're not working from a system. And they tend to think like, well, I'm going to do a webinar or I'm going to do a challenge and I'm going to just offer lots of content and then I'm going to sell. And whether you're doing a webinar or a challenge or a video series, the reality is there is structure and systems to the content and the promotion that needs to be in place. And so for the person that I'm thinking of, um, she hasn't actually like filled out our testimonial form yet. So I can't say names and, and yeah. details because I don't have a release form, um, but I can talk, talk about what they did. Um, they doubled because they changed the positioning of their challenge. And that's one of the big things we talk about is your positioning and your message is so important. And so many people go into a launch or a promotion without a message or a position. And that's what ends up costing them sales, even if they get a certain level of success. It's so true. Oh my gosh. I've seen this happen in my own business. And for so many of, of my students, people will come and say, I don't know, I just modeled what I saw this other person do on social media, but they're not really getting the behind the scenes. They're not seeing the pieces that are, are really what's making that machine work. And then all of the nuanced pieces with the messaging. So like, what are some of the other big mistakes that you see people make when they're approaching a challenge launch? Yeah, I think one of, one of, if not the biggest mistake is like, we just talked about his messaging, but they mm -hmm. think that by delivering like lots and lots of value that they're going to create um, trust and authority and connection with people. But what happens is a lot of people over deliver in their challenges. And I think it's about making this, this mindset shift that you're not shortchanging people by giving them less information. You're actually shortchanging people by giving them too much information. So there's three things we have to keep in mind. Number one, people didn't pay to be there, so they have less skin in the game. Like that's just the reality. Um, when people pay, they have more skin in the game. The second thing is people are busy. They've got other stuff going on. We like to think that this challenge is the only thing that they're invested in, but it's not. And then the third thing is they're trying to get results. They're not trying to learn. And by over delivering value, you get people stuck in this learning mode. And so what you have to do is really peel back the layers of content that you're providing and say, what is the minimum amount of content I can provide to get people some sort of tangible result that shows them what's possible? So for example, I love to use Instagram as an example because it's just so easy to explain. Um, if you're teaching people Instagram and you're like, I'm going to do a five-day Instagram challenge, that's dramatically different than a five days to your next hundred followers on Instagram training. 
And so many people are like, I'm going to do a challenge. I'm going to do a five day challenge on this and I'm going to provide information and I'm going to train and I'm going to teach and people are going to respect me and love me because I gave so much away for free when the reality is they want to get a result. And so if you show them the minimum they need to do to get say a hundred followers, they're going to trust their own results because there's two types of trust you have to build in a challenge. You have to build trust in you as the teacher, but you also have to build trust in themselves as people with the ability to actually do it. Because so many people are like, I've tried this or I've tried that and it doesn't work or I'm different or I'm, I'm special. And mm -hmm. they think it doesn't work Everyone for them. Everyone thinks they're special. <laughs> Everybody thinks they're special. Yeah. But the reality is, <laughs> Most business principles are just that business principles yeah. that apply to everybody. And so you need to prove to them that they can actually get results. So to just bring it back around this big mistake that people make is they think they can just deliver lots of value and that builds connection. But the reality is showing them a result delivers a lot of connection. And one of the best parallels I can explain is like webinars. I can't tell you how many people I see complain like, Oh, the first 15 minutes of a webinar is just a bunch of framing, just get to the content, right? Um, but the reality is from the back end, we've done it both ways and our webinars convert better when there's introduction, yep. they just do. And so you can be by the numbers or you can be by the, the fear of criticism. Um, and the reality is I'd rather operate from the numbers because I am running a business. So that is like my big advice to people is don't give away so much that you overwhelm people that you, get them stuck in learning mode and that you stop them from getting results. I love that you're so in the numbers. And I actually, with everything that you just said, I experienced this firsthand with a challenge launch that I did. I went into it from a lack mindset and I was like, I am just going to over deliver and I love teaching. And so I basically, the content was awesome. People still ask me about it, but I fire hose people yeah. with like, 30 to 40 minute live videos because people just kept asking questions on live. And I was like, oh, and this and do this and do this. And then I gave exercises at the end. Basically, it was all about storytelling. And I could have just taken that very first video that I did and made that the entire five day challenge. Oh no, but I gave them five full days of like 40 minute videos and exercises. So when I finally got to the damn pitch, people were like, oh, I'm still on day three. I'm like, yeah. oh, are you like an enroll? And they were like, oh, this challenge was amazing, but I'm still like working on the exercise from day four. So I got them totally stuck in learning mode and they didn't buy because I didn't get them the result fast enough. And I just over, over delivered, but not in the way that gets somebody to take action. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, so think, good. I think the other thing to remember is that most people deliver content and leaders deliver transformation. Mm. And so if you can deliver that transformation, people are going to trust you way more than if you teach them the theory of anything. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think sometimes we get stuck in that idea of like, oh, it needs to be like a certain length. Or I remember like, they're all going to be 30 minutes. It was like, but why? Like if I can explain something in five, why am I going to like stretch this video out? People want like, give me the fastest path. That's what I want. Exactly. What do you think it is that gets people kind of stuck in that? Like, what do you think is like the belief behind that? Well, I think the belief is twofold. I think one, they have a fear that people are going to be like, I didn't learn anything mm. or you didn't give me anything or you didn't create anything for me. Right. Um, and I think that that's the, the, the big thing that gets people stuck is this fear that their audience is going to say, I didn't learn anything. Um, I think the other thing that really gets people stuck is they hear online, like deliver value or give lots of value, um, lead with value and people will buy um, but like one of the things I always think about is, you know, think about infomercials, right? Do they really lead? Like, is it, is it really packed with value or is it really illustrating why you should buy this thing? Mm. And there's a reason that infomercials work. And there's a reason that there's multi-million dollar companies running infomercials because they're not, they're not like, oh my gosh, let's teach you how to make a million recipes in this crock pot, right? Or like the Instapot or the pressure cooker. Maybe they, they show you, maybe they do, um, they offer some sort of like, here's here, we're going to make a recipe, but they're really just illustrating their vehicle to solve your problem. And so mm. you really have to get in that mindset of I'm not teaching, I'm solving problems. So freaking good. Cause that is what a lot of people do where let's say they're a health coach, they'll end up giving away all of their recipes thinking, why are people not 
getting results. And it was like, if people needed recipes, they'd be going to Pinterest. They can find yeah. recipes. There's no shortage of content out there. So then what is the shift that people need to make, whether it be in their own beliefs or in the way that they're approaching their challenge so that they are effectively getting people that transformation versus just bombarding them with more. Instead of just giving people more content, make sure that you're creating a transformation. And yeah. I can almost hear my clients going, yeah, but how do I do that? Or like, not even how do I do that, but how do you determine the distinction between a lot of content and a transformation? Totally. So there's something called the PSP model, which is not something I created, but it's called the problem solution problem model. And a lot of times we, we, we shortchange ourselves and we follow the problem solution model, but we don't think the next step. So one of the best ways to illustrate this, I think, is to give you an example. And so we had a, we used to have a program on Facebook ads. We've actually discontinued it, which is like a whole nother story, but <laughs> we actually discontinued yeah. our Facebook ads program. But when we started promoting that Facebook ads program with a challenge, we actually didn't do a challenge on Facebook ads because the problem our audience was telling us they had is they're not making enough sales. And that's what they kept saying. Like, I'm not making sales. I'm not making sales. And like what I knew as like the leader is like, they, they really don't have a sales problem. They have a traffic problem. They're not putting their offer in front of enough people. And that's why they have a sales problem. Um, but they're so busy saying they have a sales problem that I'm not going to convince them they have a traffic problem. I'm not going to. Yep. So what I did was I ran a challenge called how to build your first sales funnel in five days. And so the problem is I want sales. The solution is here's a sales funnel, but it creates a new problem, which is how the heck do I fill up the sales funnel I just built? Well, then you need Facebook ads, Yes. right? So you have to be thinking, what is the problem they have? What's the solution I can offer? And what is that real problem that I can bring them to the conclusion of that my product solves? Because oftentimes we are like, I know their problem. I know what their problem is, but we have to get them there on their own. Mm. This is so important because I see one thing that a lot of people are doing is they're just kind of arbitrarily picking a, a, a launch or creating a freemium or even building a webinar on something that that's kind of random, but they're not making that connection in the yeah. way that you did. And like how, when people do that, like just so they understand, like how does that affect the buying behavior and how does that ultimately affect your bottom line? Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing to realize is like, look, if you can show people that the problem that they have, the, the second P in the PSP, if you can illustrate that your product solves that with, a, with good messaging, right? You still need good messaging, mm -hmm. but it's going to increase your sales because let me, let me ask you this. Um, is it easier to convince someone like, Hey, like let's use weight loss as an example, right? Yeah. Is it easier to convince someone that they don't need to lose weight or is it easier to convince someone that they should lose weight? And by the way, the solution is focusing on your mindset, your underlying beliefs and your, your exercise habits, let's say, right? You can meet that person who's like, I need to lose five pounds and say, well, you don't need to lose five pounds. You need to change the way you're thinking and change the way you're eating and change this and change that. But they're like, well, I don't want to do that. I just want to lose five pounds. Yep. Right. If you don't meet them where they are, they will not believe that your program gets the results. And that's where the sales piece comes in is if you can really illustrate to them that your product solves a problem they didn't realize they had, that's going to change things. Um, another really good example is um, uh, like money mindset. Denise Stuffield Thomas has a fantastic book. And there's an exercise in the book where you basically write down your beliefs about money. And the book is basically like, the book is called like Get Rich, Lucky Bitch. It's, it's how to get, get rich, right? Uh -huh. Because her audience is saying, I want to make more money. But once you get inside, the solution is she's like, well, let's sit down and let's walk through what you actually believe about money. And then her next, the, the new problem is like, well, how do I shift these beliefs? And that's what the rest of the book is about. It's about changing those beliefs. Even though the title of the book is Get Rich, the actual book is about changing your beliefs. And so you have to walk people through that process so that they trust what you know as the expert that they need is what they as the consumer want. Ah, oh, thank you. I love the way that you just framed this because I talk about this rather frequently with clients of mine where they come in as a health and wellness coach or business coach or whatever, and then they decide to pivot 
And they're like, well, I don't really want to teach people health and wellness anymore. I really want to help them with mindset. I'm like, in relation to health and wellness, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want to, I want to say that I'm a mindset coach. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, tell me more. And as we kind of unravel it, ultimately they're doing the exact same thing. They're teaching the same content, but they're realizing that mindset has, a, I'm like, listen, I don't think you're some shallow a-hole that only wants to help people lose 30 pounds. <laughs> like, well, here you go. Here's your uh, like meal plan and your workout program. See you later. Like, no, of course you're, you're showing up as a coach, but everything that you just said, like, I hope that you guys, like, if you didn't hear that, like hit the little like rewind button. And listen to that again, because if you're selling people what you want to give them versus what they actually want, you're not going to get sales. Like your messaging is going to be off the bottom line. And mindset is so intangible. And I know you, <laughs> that's why like, I love when you're helping people figure these things out because I'm always like, is it tangible? Is it measurable? Like, is it quantifiable? Like, give me the, give me the details. Like, show me like, what the end result's going to be. Like, I do not like things that are wishy-washy. And I have so Absolutely. appreciate that you do that. And that's one thing that you really help people with when they're figuring out how to name their challenge. Because this yeah. is another big thing where people get stuck. Where people are like, it's the, it's the feel better you, sexy life you in 21 days. Like, I'm like, no, what does that yeah. mean? Yeah, so, when you're naming it, it needs to be so specific and so tangible that people know what to expect at the end of five days. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So what are like, other than that, are there any other big mistakes that you see people making with naming their challenge? Um, I think in certain spaces, calling it a challenge works really well, like in the health and wellness space, especially because people are like, yeah, I'm going to take on that challenge. Um, but in like the B2B space or um, like marketing or, or mindset or um, like it really helps to call it what they'll create in five days. So like mm. um, we have one client that we're working with or a student we're working with who is like running a, uh, a challenge and it was called like the, the get 20 leads uh, in five days challenge. And we were like, well, that's not really specific, right? What if we called it the get 20 leads or, or on Facebook without using Facebook ads in just five days? And then it's no longer this challenge and we're, we're in the, the process of testing, but we're hoping that that increases the sign up conversions because it's no longer this challenge. It's this specific thing. So just not being specific enough is a huge mistake that we see people make. Mm. And I know for a lot of the health and wellness girls that I coach, especially if they've worked in certain network marketing companies, they have like a very adverse reaction to the word challenge. Yeah. So I think that's such, that's such a good, uh, nugget would you call it something else like a series or like a workshop or math anything works like a series yeah. training um training series mm -hmm. uh, live experience five day experience like it doesn't really matter what you call it as long as it's tied to an outcome yeah no this is so good so then in terms of filling challenges I know you're so big into facebook ads and and doing paid marketing because like hello why would you not use that but for a lot of people, they, they haven't really gotten into that yet. So if, if they're just starting out, maybe they're running their first challenge. They don't have a lot of like email stuff set up. They are literally just like pop, throwing up a, a Facebook group and they're going to go live for five days and like bare bones, that's their challenge. Um, yeah. What would be some like simple things that they should be looking at in order to get that offer in front of more people? Yeah. So one of the biggest things that you can do, and this is kind of like a ninja hack, is write a really great blog post that the content upgrade, which is something where it enhances their experience, but they have to opt in for it, is to sign up for the challenge and promote it like two weeks before the challenge starts. So, and I'm not talking about like a 400 word blog post, like we write these and this is a little overwhelming, I know, but we write these four to 5,000 word blog posts that are like really epic. And you might be like, well, if I give everything away in 4,000 words, who's going to sign up for the challenge? And like the answer is everyone. Well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because they're going to be like, wow, this is so good. I want to experience this in real time. And then you take that and you promote it organically because it's so much easier to get shares on free content than it is to get shares on opt into my thing. And so what we recommend is that you write this really long form blog post and you just promote the heck out of it with Facebook live and organic marketing and Instagram. And then this is where it gets really ninja is reach out to people in your network, like 10 to 20 people and ask them to share your blog post. Now I'm not somebody who's like, 
you know, tell them like, it's tied to my challenge. I'm trying to promote my challenge, but I'd love it if you could just promote my free blog post, even just as a Facebook post and say, here's, here's all the content you need to promote it. Here's an image. Here's the, here's the copy. Here's everything you need to promote it. Would you be willing to share this nine times out of 10 people are like, yeah, totally. I'll share your free blog post. Ask friends, ask, ask colleagues, ask people around you and get that blog post out there. Now, if you then got a little bit of money to put behind Facebook ads, you can retarget everybody that's read that blog post into your challenge. You can also retarget people that have watched your Facebook lives into your challenge. And then you can also just do general organic promotion of your challenge. And I tell people so often people are like, well, I don't have a big audience or I don't have a ton of people, but like if you can get 25 to 50 people signed up organically, which 99% of you watching this can, if you've been in business for more than one or two months and you've built connections online, like you've got enough people to start filling up a challenge. In my opinion, um, don't neglect the power of just general organic advertising, post it on Instagram, post it on Facebook, find new ways to post it, do a boomerang one day, do a long form post about your story and why you're running the challenge, do a short form form post that just like come sign up for my challenge and promote the dang thing every single day. Tag people that are already in and ask them, are you excited? Invite people to share with a friend. We actually, when we run challenges, we try to buy a domain name for like 12 bucks. And we ask people, here's the domain. As soon as they register, sign up, uh, share this with a friend. So we usually use five day and we'll say share five day with a friend. And mm-hmm. that gets us organic signups. So it's like, think outside the box, be lean into your organic network and don't be afraid to try new things before you start running advertisements. We have people who rock their challenges organically before they ever spend a dime on Facebook ads and it works either way. And when you're doing the organic stuff and you see that working, that's when you really know your messaging is like on freaking point, especially if you're in front of the right audience. I do want to cut, you just gave so many freaking nuggets. I'm like, (laughs) I'm going to like listen back to this, like take copious notes. Um, Don't worry, guys, we will have a transcription of this for you so you can, we'll take the notes for you. Um, I do want to go back to retargeting because I know there's a lot of people who, when I have conversations with them about Facebook ads, they're like, this is literally, this might as well be Chinese because I don't know what that means. It's going to be a completely other language. So just so people like understand, because I think when, when, even when I'm talking to people about it, they they, they don't realize what's possible with Facebook ads. So it just seems like this big, crazy, scary thing. And they're actually pretty straightforward when you kind of get in there. And obviously I took your course that's discontinued. Sorry guys. And it was great. And I learned so much. Um, But what are like retargeting ads? Yeah. So basically Facebook has something called the pixel, which you can put on any web page that you have and it tracks activity. And so when someone reads your blog post, but doesn't opt in, you can basically tell Facebook, I want to put ads in front of that person so that they see my content. Another really simple way to think about this is when you click on something online that you shouldn't buy, but you want it. And then it Mm. follows you around the internet. That's retargeting. And you can basically do it with a small budget. um, And it's, it's a really targeted audience. So it tends to convert. Mm, Love that. And when people are like, what's a pixel? Like it's literally guys, Facebook gives you a little thing. It's like some code and you copy and you paste it. It's not, it's not anything crazy. So I'm curious too, when, when people are doing um, challenges, do you recommend that they are done via live stream or can people do them pre-recorded? Cause I've been seeing a little bit of both happening. Yeah. Some big I, I personally recommend live because the expectation of, I don't want to say quality, but I want to say the expectation of production is lower. So if you're doing pre-recorded videos, people tend to have this expectation that they should be at a certain level in my opinion. Interesting. Whereas, When you're doing a live video, people are like, it's live, right? So people aren't expecting you to be perfect. They're not expecting it to be this perfectly polished experience. They're expecting you to be down to earth, to be approachable, to be connecting with them. So I recommend a live video. The other thing is you can answer questions live and people just love that. Um, the, the, the numbers and the analytics part of my brain is also like, look, we, we run automated webinars. No shame in my game. We love automated webinars. Team automated um, webinars. Because they work. Um, but when you automate, your conversion rate drops. Yeah. Right? And I think of that as the same process. Like, if you're going to automate your challenge, you may see a drop in conversion rates. Why wouldn't you do it live when you know that live tends to get higher engagement, higher reach on the algorithm, and Facebook just favors live videos. So 
whether you come at it from this perspective of live is more approachable or live is statistically better or Facebook prefers live video, I think there's just so many signs that point to live is better. That being said, we have students who have done pre-recorded that have been successful. And if you're like, I'm totally not ready to go live, you're going to absolutely do pre-recorded and you're still going to get results. I mm -hmm. would just make the case that live video is better. I agree with that. And I would say, even if you are going to do pre-record, like maybe mix and match, maybe it's like you've got the, the pre-recorded video and then jump on live inside the group absolutely. to those people just so that they can see that you're a real person. Yes. And yeah. Get live video in there in some way, shape or form because it, it just... It really helps you connect with your audience. Yeah. When you're doing um, challenges, what do you see when you're re like relaunching the same challenge over and over again? Do you usually recommend that people like tweak them or do a different style or different content? Uh, yeah. So you definitely want to tweak what didn't work. So anytime we do a launch, we do a full debrief where we basically review the stats, we review the numbers, we review the conversions, we, re we try to review email open rates. I'll be honest, I'm not as good at that one. Um, <laughs> we wanna review everything and see what happened. How far did people make it along? What was our engagement? How many views did we get on these videos? And we, we, run, um, we run all those numbers and then we say what worked well and what didn't work well from both a numbers and a quality standpoint. So like one thing that doesn't work well for me is, um, being really in, plugged into the group in the morning. So uh, I'm not a morning person. I don't like doing things in the morning. I do my best to block off my calendar from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, but when I'm in a challenge, I have to engage with those people first thing in the morning. So for me, it means I need to evaluate like going to bed early during the launch. And that sounds silly, but that's something that's going to affect the overall experience. So I'm going to change the way I show up a little bit differently. Um, another thing is we have a video, we had a day four where we just had all these comments of people were like, I'm confused, I'm confused, I'm confused, I'm lost. And so we changed all the content of day four. We didn't change the exercise, but we changed the way we presented it. And the next time we were in the challenge, it was really effective. Now, in terms of how often can you repeat the exact same challenge with these little tweaks, as frequently as you can get new people in. Yeah. Right? So it's like, sometimes I get the mindset of like, well, I don't want to repeat the same challenge because... I don't want my audience to be like, well, I already saw this. But if you're always building your audience, there's always new people to build that challenge. There's also people who sign up for your challenge again and again and again and buy the third or fourth time. So I'm working with um, a client who just messaged me and said, I got this email from somebody who's like, I've been following you for a year. I'm on day two of your challenge. I'm buying your product right now because they're they they somehow found their product. Wow. And they're like, I'm buying it right now. I just need to know which level to buy. Like that person's been with them for a year and if, and they're doing the same challenge they did in the past. And if they had changed it, they would have missed that opportunity to connect. So you've got these long-term followers that are gonna plug back into your challenge multiple times, but you've also got the ability to reach new people. So if you can get 100 new people into your challenge every single time, then you can do the exact same challenge because those people haven't seen it before. So whether you have a massive audience or you don't have a massive audience, there's no reason not to repeat and duplicate a challenge. Yes. And I think too, just to add to that, it's going to make it a lot simpler for you guys. You're not going to have to recreate everything from scratch. Like. Yeah. Zach, you are like the ninja when it comes to debriefs and like knowing your numbers and having everything super dialed in. And God, my business is not even remotely close to that. But I think there is so much power when you can look at a launch and say, wow, look at the views. This went up, that went up. Why did this go down? Or, hey, we, we made more money this, this round, but our conversion rate was lower. Like what happened there? So like there's like very nuanced things that even, even though you may be more profitable, something could be going wrong in the launch. So really learning how to do that debrief is, is super, super freaking important too. Um, yeah. The other thing I really want to talk about is like, obviously when someone opens car and goes through the launch, there's a lot of emotional ups and downs <laughs> that happen. And when you're doing a launch, like a live challenge, and you have to be present on live video every single day, that could be really challenging for people, especially if they feel like, oh my God, I opened car and it's bombing. So I would love for you to just share some of the trends that you see with kind of what are the ups and downs yeah. when do the maximum people buy just so that people go in knowing that it's not just going to be a constant stream of buyers. 
Yeah. So the biggest thing we tend to see is that when cart opens, you want to get an influx of sales, but that doesn't always happen because the crux of our system is using a live video. And then just depending on the size of your challenge, you may not have a ton of people show up for your pitch. Mm -hmm. And so you don't get this massive influx of sales right when you say the doors are open, um, even though that's what we would expect. But you yeah. do start to get a steady stream of sales once you start sending out sales emails, which is something we teach. Like write out your six sales emails and have them scheduled out in advance. So um, we tend to see that when cart opens, it's like slow at first, but then it starts to pick up. And then once the cart is open for a period of time, we tend to see a decrease in the amount of sales. So you start kind of high, you go low, and then when the cart's closing, that's where the big influx comes in. So we call it a J curve because if you map it out, it looks like a J. Um, and so it's totally normal. I can't tell you how many people in the Facebook group are like, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. And then on the last day, they're like, I got a bunch of sales. <laughs> um, it happens so, so frequently um, that, that we actually have people who chime in all the time and are like, yeah, that's totally normal. Like, don't panic yet. Um, but I think the other thing that you mentioned is like, it is really hard to be present when that's happening. And I think the biggest thing to realize is like so much easier said than done, but remove yourself from the attachment of the result. Like realize that completing the challenge is the success not the sales. And mm -hmm. that's really easy to say. And I, I know it's really easy to say. Um, but it's true that if you can realize like, we have a, we have somebody we work with, you and I, and, and they like to say, um, uh, you either get the result you want or you learn. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I think that that's just so important to keep in mind is like, you either get that result you want or you learn. And if you come from that growth and abundant mindset, then it's much easier to stay present. Cause you're like, man, I'm not getting any sales, but the most successful people we see in the program are the people who say, I didn't get any sales, but um, this was still a massive success. I grew my email list, or I learned how to run my challenge, or I got some results, or I learned a lot about myself. Those people, ironically, tend to get those last minute sales. And those are the people who run another challenge and get sales the next time around, or repeat yep. their challenge and get results. Um, we just had somebody run their third five figure challenge. And before they ever started the challenge, they were like, this is already a massive success. Wow. And just by declaring that and seeing that they have yet another success in the process. So that to me are like the two sides of the coin is like, it is normal to have a little bit of launch free fall. Um, but when you realize <laughs> that the challenge is the success, then it's less stressful. That's such an awesome reframe and really allows you to be in control of the results and be in control of defining what success actually is. And yeah. I think, you know, just even talking about the ups and downs and the free fall, you know, so many friends of ours and peers, like I've just seen so many people relaunching the same products and just going from like 20,000, the first launch to a hundred thousand to 300,000 to like, you know, on and on and on. And every single time they relaunch the same product, it grows. Or if they have it on evergreen, that income and that impact is just compounding over time. And I think yeah. if there's just another little mindset tweak for you guys today, it's that if you think it's not working, like exactly what Zach says, focus on things that you can control, focus on, you know, putting the content out there and then recognize that, you know, if you're, if you're claiming, oh, this is a failure because X, Y, Z, and you're building a story around it and you're scrapping the entire thing, well, you're missing out on all that potential, all that opportunity to refine your process and have an even bigger launch next time. Like you just have to ask yourself, are you, are you playing the long game? Yeah. And like, that's even been big. That's been a big theme for me this last year, you know, building on an evergreen funnel. I'm just like, I'm playing the long game, like put my head down. I mean, you've obviously been in business since you were freaking 13. So <laughs> I mean, you're like, you, you can definitely speak to the long game, but like, what does that really look like from somebody who's been going at this and, and building businesses and you know, serving yeah. people and creating content. What, what is your like beliefs? What is your mindset around business and the long game? Well, I think the biggest thing is like always to tell people like, look, it's not like we have these successful launches and then we're like, Oh, check the box. Mindset's Ooh. good. Yep. It's something that you're always, always working on. And 
I would be lying if I didn't say that I, I wake up some days like, man, I don't know if we want X, Y, and Z because it means blah, 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 blah. Um, and I think we all have stories. And I think the biggest thing to realize is like, look, the, the biggest thing for me that has helped me break through some of my mindset blocks and the barriers and the things that I've, I dealt with is to do the things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes like, sometimes we're like, well, I don't know if I can achieve that. Right. And so that's where we stop is like, oh, I don't know if I could have my first $10,000 launch. So we just don't do anything or we yeah. get really busy in the activities that don't make a difference. We're like, I'm just going to post on social media every day and build a massive following. And then one day, maybe down the road, I'll have that launch. But like, what if you plan to have that launch in two months and you just went for it? Yeah. And what if you, you know, there's, there's, there's someone who says, not a huge fan of them, but they like to say, <laughs> um, so I won't name drop. <laughs> well, now we're going to go Google their, their yeah, quote. Go Google <laughs> Um, but there's somebody who basically says, if you set this goal, that's X times bigger than what you actually want to achieve. When you come up short, you overachieve that, that lame goal that you would have set. Mm. I'm not a huge fan because they are like, that goal's lame and this, that, and the other. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> who it is. Um, yeah. um, but anyway, you know, I, I love that is like set these big goals, come up short on a big goal rather than setting an achievable goal that you know you're going to hit. Mm -hmm. that for me has always been really big too yeah it's like shoot for what is it shoot for the moon and, and if you land among, men the land among the stars a nice little bumper sticker yeah um, but th this is so good and I think really talking about the mindset piece of this is where people don't really focus their attention when it comes to doing a launch but and they're like just give me the strategy like tell me what to put in my emails give me your swipe copy and like listen I could I could jam on that for days and i also think talking about the free fall and like the expectation that these are like nothing's wrong with you you're not bombing this is completely normal if not to be expected like right. people who are doing multi-million dollar launches are seeing very similar trends you may be seeing them on a smaller scale but there's nothing wrong with you and if maybe you're not seeing these things then you know that's can hook you up with <laughs> with his strategies for making this <laughs> a little bit smoother and more profitable um but is there anything else in relation to challenge that that maybe we didn't talk about that you really feel like you want to leave people with a good little nugget yeah no pressure um if i'm gonna leave it could be people anything with yeah it would it would be this um your challenges scale with time and we recommend that if you're going to get started you have a two to $300 budget for Facebook ads. And I, I say that in my program, I say that on my sales page. Um, I'm really like a huge fan of like, look, you, you need to be willing to invest a little bit. And I like to tell people, look, if you were gonna start a business 20 years ago, you would need a storefront or you would need a training space or you would need to buy flights. Like I don't, even if you were in the education space 20 plus years ago, there was overhead. And now there's like almost no overhead or minimal overhead and you need to be willing to invest in your challenge and your software and your systems. Yeah. And that can be scary. And we can say like, well, I don't know if it's going to work out or I don't know if it's going to pan out, but you need to come from a place of this is what it takes to get results. And very rarely, like very rarely do I see someone who's like massively successful that didn't invest a little bit in advertising or didn't or didn't invest in software or system. Even the people who have massive um, blogs, like perfect example is like um, people who have built up massive followings with blogs and then pivot into the education space. Mm. Well, they're paying for a blog platform. They're investing their time on Pinterest. They are paying to upgrade their servers to have the capacity for the people they need. They're buying plugins for their blog. They're buying software. They're consulting with people. Like, you need to be willing to invest a little bit to make the system work. And I think that's the biggest thing I can leave people with is like, be willing to put a little bit in. And, and I always say there's two forms of investment, time and money. And the more you have of one, the less you need of the other. And you just have to figure out where you are in the process, but know that if you can invest a little bit of revenue, it's going to save you so much time. Yes. And I see way too many people only using organic marketing strategies and struggling to get their offer in front of the right people. Like clients of mine, they're like, they specialize in thyroid health or they, they niche themselves down, which is super powerful. But the people on their Facebook newsfeed are not people who are struggling with that very specific thing. And so they're like, well, this isn't working or nobody joined my challenge. But it's like, 
yeah, you got a hundred people, but they were a hundred super targeted people because those were the only people in your friend group who had that thyroid condition. So like what you're saying is like, stop wasting time because you're never going to get that time back and put a little money into Facebook ads and start getting your offer in front of the right people. Cause those are the people who are going to buy, like that's how you're going to be more profitable. And I think, you know, people have failed so many times and by fail, I mean, given Facebook money and didn't know how to set things up and then lost yeah. money. And when you actually know how to set them up effectively, like things that I've learned from you, you get an ROI. Yeah. Like you put in a hundred dollars and you get $500 back. What, in what world would you not continuously do that? Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I think that's such an important thing for people to understand the concept of traffic. Yeah. That you need more eyeballs. Absolutely. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for this. This was freaking amazing. Um, where can people go to hang out with you and learn more about you and your challenge processes? Yeah. So if you want to learn more, you can head over to heartsoulhustle.com. And right there on the main page, we have links to, it's an on-demand webinar, no shame yeah. in my game. Um, but if and you're looking for just some, some quick content or you, you're like, yes, a challenge is for me, you can head over to heartsoulhustle.com forward slash challenge book. And we have this miniature workbook that walks you through everything you need to um, build, execute, and fill your challenge. So it'll walk you through the process of coming up with a name for your challenge, coming up with the five days of content, and actually figuring out what is the best way for you, depending on where you're at in your business, to market and fill that challenge. So you want to check that out. You can download that. It's a nice little PDF that we had designed, heartsoulhustle.com forward slash challenge book, and it's yours. Amazing. I'm going to link all of that up for you guys as well. Zach, seriously, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. I just freaking adore you and like everything that you're doing. Like you're just a freaking genius. So I really, really appreciate you just taking the time to share that with everyone today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's been a blast. All right, awesome. Well, thank you guys for listening and I'm gonna link all that up so you can go and connect more with Zach. Have a good one.